Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 192 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the new Bible movie Risen, about a Roman officer who witnesses the crucifixion of Jesus and investigates the mystery of the empty tomb. And this will involve spoilers, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by two guests. So first up, we've got Richard Carrier, who you may remember from our panel on Noah back in episode 108, and our panel on Exodus, Gods, and Kings back in episode 130. He holds a PhD in ancient history from Columbia, and is the author of such books as Not the Impossible Faith, Proving History, and On the Historicity of Jesus, which argues that Jesus Christ may never have existed. So Richard, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. This is great. Glad to be back. And also joining us today is Dan Barker. He served as a Christian preacher for 19 years, but left Christianity in 1984, a journey he recounts in his book, Losing Faith in Faith, From Preacher to Atheist. Along with his wife, Annie Laurie Gaylor, he's the co-president of the Freedom from Religion Foundation, which works to uphold church-state separation. His newest book, which he conceived with Richard Dawkins, is called God, the Most Unpleasant Character in All Fiction. So, Dan, welcome to the show. Hi, David. Thanks. This is fun. Okay, so let's start off with Dan. So, Dan, what are your feelings in general about Jesus movies? Have you enjoyed any of them? (laughs) Oh, enjoy is like, I guess that's a good word. You know, it's like enjoying some old movie that's so bad that it's good. You know, Uh, I remember when Annie Laurie and I went to see The Last Temptation of the Christ, and I was sitting there thinking it through, you know, all of the theological implications and did Paul really say this and did Jesus do that? And I was really grappling with, you know, everything in the movie. And I looked over at Annie Laurie and she was sitting there snickering <laughs> through the whole thing. <laughs> like, you got to be serious. People people take this seriously. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> you, it, a movie is a movie. And of course, you know, like Richard, and uh, you know, I, I, you know, I believed it. And so I, I'm kind of curious, I guess, to see how these movies are made. Yeah, well, this movie Risen is sort of being pitched as an unofficial sequel to The Passion of the Christ, the Mel Gibson <laughs> film. Did you? What did you think of that one? Oh, you know, I didn't actually see that film. I didn't want to pay money to see. The, I think I heard that it was the most violent film, minute by minute, in all of history. And I thought, there's so much talk about The Passion. Why go see it? Yeah, I didn't see it either. It was the um, I saw the scene of the the, the scourging of Jesus because it's in. Um, the God who wasn't there, uh, right? You know, Brian Fleming's movie that I, that features me and Bob Price and various other people. And, uh, but so that he has like, he runs the clock on how much horrible violence in this is in this one scene. And I was like, I don't really need to see this movie. This is horrible. Um, but it, the, the Jesus in Risen is not nearly as scourged as the, as the Jesus in that. So it doesn't really tie in. The continuity is not there as a sequel. <laughs> Well, in The God Who Wasn't There, there's this great part where they show a, a nail being driven into Jesus's hand or something, and this little squirt of blood shoots up. Yes. And he says, you know, someone had to be sitting there with a little blood squirter. That's, that's right. That's, that's, that's how obsessed they were with getting all the that's blood right. into this movie. Yep. Okay, right. but, it, but it is true that this new movie, Risen, kind of takes off where that left off, you know? True, it, it, yeah. It, you know, you, you you see the final scene on the cross, but you don't see – there's nothing about the trial. There's nothing about anything leading up to that. It's just sort of a given, and now we're going – it's maybe Jesus the sequel or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, I mean, so, Dan, what did you think of Risen just overall? Well, the first half of the movie, I was going with it. Like, okay, this is a movie. This is kind of – you know, movies can be fun. And, and the scenery was pretty amazing, kind of – I think it was filmed in Spain and it was, yeah. you know, and so just to be in a movie is kind of fun. And all right. So here's a, here's a, it's like historical fiction, except it's a fiction of a fiction. And if you know all that, like when you watch, <laughs> when you're watching science fiction, you say, all right, let's go with this. Right. So it was kind of a mystery tale and kind of a chase scene. And I thought, oh, all right, why not? But then towards the end, it just totally mm. got ludicrous and, and, <laughs> uh, you know, for for my even as an atheist, I I could appreciate a, a religious movie, but it just fell apart towards the end with this total stupid. Uh, I, Richard probably saw the same thing I saw. Here's these these hippie looking surfer uh, <laughs> disciples with these 
kind of knowing grins on their face, huddled around this guru guy named Jesus who's got this kind of starry-eyed look. And they're kind of walking by the Sea of Galilee. And and then all of a sudden, I, I don't know why the movie makers did this, but all of a sudden, about a thousand bats come flying out of a cave. <laughs> <laughs> Did you notice that, Richard? I did. And, I didn't understand the point of it. Yeah. And, and, well, it seems to me that maybe he was saying, is this a baddie movie or what? But, but there was no point here. All these bats flying in your face right, right after Jesus is blessing his disciples. So I think that pretty much summed up the ending for me. <laughs> no, it's funny that you say first half and second half because that was my impression too. The first half of the movie, I was thinking like, this is a really good sp- screenplay. Like in, in terms of like uh, uh, historical fiction, I mean, I, the – all you have to do is you have to figure out like what is a plausible origin story that could, that could explain all the legends later and as long as it like is plausible within historical context you can make up anything you want you can make a good story and they were doing a really good job of it like it was it was really good for like the first half and then it just fell apart plot wise in the second half the second half was boring it was meandering it 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 was unclear it was almost like they had different writers for the first half and the second half it was really strange yeah, and then then you wonder, well, then what was the point? I mean, yes, you know, what was, <laughs> why why do this? You know, some some author wrote the book, I guess, and so they wanted to make a movie out of it. But uh, I I don't think so. It's an original screenplay. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, well, I, I, th- I thought that too when I was watching. I was like, are they adapting a novel? But no, I checked, and it looks like it's the director co-wrote the screenplay. It's an original screenplay. Yeah, there is a novelization, but it's based on a screenplay. Yeah. Oh, is that yeah. it? Okay. Okay. All right. I'll have to give them props though. They ha- they got a not white guy for the for Jesus. They they hired Cliff Curtis, who's Maori. Um. So so and he looks kind of plausibly mid uh, you know Middle Eastern in a sense. Um. So you know it wasn't the usual Aryan Jesus. Let's put it that yeah, way. Yeah. Except everybody everybody else. Uh. You know all the disciples were these white guys with English accents. I mean, so it was a <laughs> obviously a British movie. <laughs> Well, true. They even had Ray Fiennes as the, uh, or not yeah. Ray, uh, uh, John, Jonathan, John Fiennes. Uh, jo- jo- uh, as... It's actually Joseph. Jo- oh, it's oh, Joe Fiennes. Oh. That's right, Joe Fiennes, uh, who is Ray Fiennes' brother. But well, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, and he did a fantastic job too. I mean, in his in his role, I mean, he he always turns in a good performance, and he did a really good one in this. Yeah, but I, I totally agree with you guys that I thought the first act of the movie was was really pretty interesting. And I thought I really had a really hard time staying awake through the second act. <laughs> and then the third act, I, I thought, was just really pretty corny. Mm-hmm. Um, and I felt like the first part was was more original. They were trying to do an interesting story. And as it got into the, the second half of the movie, it just became about pounding a message. And I didn't actually realize when I made plans to see that, that see this that it was made by Affirm Films, which is some sort of avowedly Christian um, you know, film studio. The weird thing I had about that is that they didn't pound a message very well in the second half. This was actually the biggest problem I had is that that at no point in the movie did they explain what the gospel was. That that was like it was almost like they were like really avoiding ever discussing what the gospel is, and that was actually. It, historically, the most unrealistic part of the entire film is no one ever talks about apocalypticism. No one ever talks about sin. No one ever talks about atonement as being the function of the the death of Jesus. Uh, they, they don't even really talk about the morals. Like they just sort of vaguely talk around them, but they never ever actually say what the gospel is. They never say why Jesus had to die. They never say like they don't talk about prophecy that this was fulfilled prophecy. I mean, it's almost the entirety of Christianity was deleted from the film, and they just had sort of this vague hippie. Jesus is all about love, man. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. And even that was very unclear. It was like uh, I don't understand like. Why are you? Why were the disciples following this guy? Other than the fact that he's a nice guy who is a sorcerer, that was, that was like really all that they showed. Is was a sorcerer who has some mild abilities, and he was nice, and that was really the only thing. Okay, I I agree, uh, Richard. That that's absolutely right. There's just all this background that's assumed. But uh, on the one hand, if you knew somebody who was dead who came back to life, you'd, you'd probably want to hang around. And, you know, if that really happened, that would be kind of interesting. <laughs> be better than a magic trick, but. <laughs> but at the end of the movie, uh, at the very, very end, with that silly ascension scene walking into the sun, I mean, that was yeah. a computer graphic, whatever. Uh, <laughs> but at the very end, he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. 
And so just wait, I'll be back. So it's, you know, eternal life. At least you got get that. Eternal right. life is a, you know. Right, yeah. Well, that was the other thing was um, they're already talking about this eternal life stuff and embracing, even embracing, uh, you know, Clavius, the Roman. And this is another thing that the whole idea of embracing Gentiles, allowing Gentiles in, that was a later development. That was, that was Paul who came along later and said, actually, you know what? You don't have to become a Jew to become a Christian. The first Christians were all like, no, that's it. The Jews are the master race. We're the only ones going to heaven. And, you know, the Gentiles, you're all screwed. You know, that was, that was the original gospel. Uh, and so they were, they were actually kind of like conflating historical events in terms of what sort of gospel status they were at. Yeah. Well, do you remember at the very end when, um, I think it was the innkeeper that he gave his mm -hmm. ring to? Um, yeah. He, he, the innkeeper at the very end of the movie, he asked Clavius, so do you believe? And he said, I believe I will never be the same. And that's not <laughs> kind of, that's not quite the way a real Christian convert would say that, you know, I, he, they, you know, I would have said, I believe Jesus is my savior and he died for me. And I, you know, but anybody yeah. could say that. I, I met Richard Carrier. I'll never be the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, that's true. There, there was, that was the thing when they had the, they were doing the interrogations uh, when Clavius was bringing people in and interrogating them. And he had Mary and this is where the movie started to fall apart. When they finally brought in Mary and Bartholomew, when they had the old lady in and he kind of dismissed her as crazy, like that actually made sense. Like she was kind of batty in the way she was reacting, interacting with him. And he sent her away. But he brings in Mary and he brings in Bartholomew. And neither of those characters were written like human beings. Like they, it was almost like a high school student wrote those scenes. They were just speaking in sort of platitudes and uh, they weren't actually making an actual effort to explain anything to Clavius. And that, that's not realistic. Like if you had these people who had this experience and he doesn't understand, they would actually try to like meet him and hit him halfway, right? Try to like, try to actually get him to understand. They would try to explain things. They wouldn't have acted the way they did in the movie. It was very unrealistically written. And that was the beginning of where the, the screenplay was very well written. Everything was very realistic. They had background facts really well done. They had like little cultural things done really well. And then, and the characters are written believably, but, but then those two characters in that scene, that was not at all believable. It was just really bad writing. Uh, and it just went downhill from there, actually. There, was, there, was, there were even worse writing fails after that, in my opinion. <laughs> well, actually, Richard, I was curious about this. What, what were some of the background facts that they did really well? Well, you know, interestingly, they, they have that battle scene at the beginning, right? So they, uh, and there are a number of interesting things about that scene where they didn't really explain very much, but uh, it, they show Clavius and his uh, basically less than a cohort of soldiers go to essentially go kill Barabbas, right? Uh, and th they never actually explain this, but it's, it's implied. And if you understand the story, you figure it out that when Pilate, you know, according to the gospel story, he lets Barabbas free because there's some sort of ritual. He's supposed to leave people free and the Jews called for Barabbas. You know, none of this is historically realistic. But it's in the Gospels, so if you're trying to make a historical fiction based on the Gospels, that makes sense. But so for it made sense to have Pilate uh, acquiesce to the Jews, let Barabbas go, and then send a cohort of soldiers and say, you know what, go kill that guy. <laughs> and that's actually how the movie begins, is the, the soldiers are there, they were sent to go kill Barabbas. And it, if you understand the story, you know that he had just been released by Pontius Pilate because the Jews had just called for his release. And so for the soldiers to have gone immediately and go and, go and kill him in the wild, you know, that, that was just like, that was very Roman. That was a very authentic political uh, way of doing it. But even the battle scene was highly realistic. They showed uh, use of Roman tactics. Uh, they used the testudo formation. They used the testudo formation uh, to mount a siege wall. I mean, it was like, you watch it and you go, that is brilliant. These Romans are fantastic tacticians. Uh, and that was all very realistic. Uh, and it was just put in there for some action scenes and to show, I guess, uh, his experience of uh, life of killing people and stuff that was wearing on him. But um, so they so they have that and they had little things like he had a, a, a pot of rosemary on his desk that he would rub his hands on to make his hands smell better. Um, that's actually authentic. They actually would do things like that. Uh, and so there were like little things like that that weren't necessary for the plot, but they threw them in. Um, and that's all in the first half of the film. But the problem is, and then the second half, they have all these Jews just casually mentioning the name Yahweh in their conversation. And that, that's like hmm. literally a death penalty offense. You don't just, you don't say Yahweh out loud. That, that's blasphemy. That is literally by definition blasphemy is saying the name of God yeah. out loud like that. And they just have them casually mentioning it in conversation. Well, even if they did, they, they wouldn't have known what those vowels were anyway. <laughs> it could have been a yihu. 
Who knows? Yeah, well, there's that too. Yeah. Right. Well, can I ask Richard a couple questions, uh, Dave? Um, oh yeah, sure, sure. Because yeah. Richard's the real historian here. Um, did Tiberius visit Jerusalem? I mean, was that scene? Was that visitation plausible? You no. Know, yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> hmm. He was going to, but I think he died before he got there. Uh, if I recall correctly, I haven't checked. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure he never visited. Uh, during the life of Pontius Pilate, he called Pontius Pilate back uh, because Pontius Pilate was pulled from his post for overstepping his bounds uh, and making the situation there worse. So he actually summoned Pontius Pilate back, and Pilate actually ended up killing himself a few years later. I actually came across a review, Richard, that said that at this point in his reign, Tiberius had become very reclusive, and there's no way he would have been traveling anywhere. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he was on the island of Capri in these years. It depends on they didn't really make clear what years these were, but uh, but yeah, in his last years, he he yeah he basically just hid out on an island for the rest of his reign. Uh, yeah, no, the idea of him coming there was supposedly talk of him coming to the Middle East, but he died before that happened. Um, but no, no, so there wasn't any emperor showing up uh, in 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 Judea. Well, then my second question related to that is um, Pilate was really worried about uh, keeping order. That, that was um, uh, the tribune's job was to keep order in Jerusalem, right? Yeah. But w would, this, would this little uprising have been that much of a disorder to the I mean, would that have been that embarrassing if there, there was talk about a dead man walking around alive again? You know, uh, not hugely, but the Romans were of the sort that they would suppress uh, a minor thing in order to send a message to anyone who might start something bigger. So, so that was at least somewhat plausible, the idea that, that, that yeah, it really in reality they would say, yeah, this isn't really a big deal, but we can't allow anyone to get away with anything because that might lead to something bigger. People would think, if you give someone a, an inch, they'll take a mile, you know. Um, so the Romans were very suppressive about that. Uh, so that, that's plausible. And in fact, it's very accurate. The one thing that wasn't accurate is that they assumed the body had been stolen. It never occurred to them. The, the first thing that would occur to them is that he'd survived the crucifixion and was still alive, right? That he's an escaped convict. And so they would have a massive manhunt for the escaped convict because his own followers are saying he's alive and giving us orders again. You're going to say, oh, yeah, resurrection, whatever. We know what really happened. We're going to find this guy. But the way they wrote it in the story, uh, they're hunting for the body. But that's still at least plausible. If, you, if you're convinced that there's a body, or there was a body, there was a corpse and he was dead, and the body's gone, there would be a massive manhunt for this to figure out, like, they're going to bring to justice the people who stole the body or trying to start this insurrection by, by what they thought would be an insurrection, by claiming that he had risen from the dead. And, uh, and so there would have been this massive manhunt. The, the interesting thing is, is that is so plausible that it actually refutes the empty tomb story and the resurrection story of the Bible because you look at the book of Acts and there is no manhunt. The Romans don't care. Like, they, they, they don't, no one, the Romans aren't saying, well, wait a minute, someone just committed a capital crime of the theft of this body. Someone's claiming that this escaped convict is alive again and giving orders. They would be doing a massive manhunt. They would be hauling people in just like they depict in the movie. But that's not, that doesn't happen in that book of Acts. In, in Acts, the Romans are just completely uninterested. Even the Jews aren't really interested. They don't even go hunting down to try and find the body. They, they never even mention that there's a, a missing body. So, uh, so it's funny that the movie in itself is kind of a refutation of the Bible because it's showing what would have happened and that we look at the, or the first history of the early church. It didn't happen. So that actually calls into question uh, the whole original claim that there ever was a missing body to begin with. And I think, if I remember right, there was a comment in the movie that if they waited too long to find this rotted body, no one would believe it was Jesus yes. anyway, you know? That's right, that's right. And within days, yeah, they find a rotted body and they pass it off as Jesus, yeah. <laughs> and so what if they had? I mean, what if they, I mean, would anybody have believed that was Jesus at that point? They, they, it would just be some old rotted body. Yeah, it would just be it would be the word of the Romans against the word of the disciples, right? So it would it would be no yeah, you're absolutely right. There wouldn't be any way that they could prove that this corpse is Jesus. And that's even that was part of the plausible part of the story where Clavius eventually just finds a body, it has similar wounds. He's pretty sure it's not Jesus. So he brings it to Pilate and says, Yeah, just claim it's Jesus. Like it's so rotted, no one's gonna tell. And that's actually probably what would have happened, right? And that it would literally have just been no one could definitively determine whether that was the body of Jesus or not. And so it would just be who believes who. And that was that would be the only that would be the only thing that would resolve from that. What did you think, Richard, about so so they cru they're crucifying these people and then they're dumping their bodies in sort of a mass grave, but they let uh Joseph of Arimathea take yeah. Jesus and entomb him in this kind of nice 
uh, right. What now, did you think of that? See, the interesting thing is that they're, I don't know where they're getting their ideas. Clearly, they're, they're, they research some of this a bit. Now, John Dominic Crossan has written that that's how they disposed of bodies after crucifixions. They would just throw them in a mass grave and dump lie on them, um, which, is, which is probably what normally happened in other places. The problem is, is that when this occurred, this is the 30s AD, the Jews still had a treaty with Rome because they had sided with Julius Caesar and with Augustus in the civil wars. So they were given a very handsome treaty where they were allowed the, their own laws. Uh, so that they can enforce their own laws. And one of those was that, that the mass grave concept was, was blasphemy. It was actually, or not blasphemy, but it was against Jewish law. Jewish law held that the bodies had to be treated and correctly buried, and they had to have, and in protect the Mishnah says that there was a specific graveyard, uh, for the condemned, and it was specifically, uh, it was, it, you would be buried in such a way that a year later you could come back, scrape the flesh from the bones, and rebury the, the convict honorably. And that was all part of the reburial system of, of uh, Jewish law that's actually written in there. So th that mass grave concept probably was used outside Judea, but it, was, it probably would have been illegal. It would be contrary to treaty. It would be a violation of treaty for the Romans to do that in Judea. So that what they would normally have done is they would have taken the convicts down before the sun goes down, or once they die, they would take them down, and they would uh, put them in what's called a graveyard of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin had its own criminal graveyard reserved just for the burial of criminals, the graves would be marked usually, so that if someone wants to come and honorably bury the criminal later after the flesh is rotten from after the flesh is rotted from the bones, they could do that. Um, and so that's that's the way it would actually have worked, and and they they did get that wrong. That wasn't probably not realistic. Uh, because I, I I was under the impression that Bart Ehrman had said that he didn't think that he had come to the conclusion that the empty tomb story was fiction mm -hmm. as a result of of the fact that it, it it's not historically realistic for Jesus to have been put in a tomb this way. Yeah, it, to have him put in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, that's the key thing because if he was put in the 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 burial grave of the the criminal's graveyard of the Sanhedrin court, uh he would have been buried with many other bodies. It's just he wouldn't have been thrown in a pit at random. Um, but there would have been many other bodies in that tomb complex, um, and it probably would have been a tomb complex. Um, it's possible it could have been buried like in the ground, and then you could dig them back up later. Um, but it, in one way or another, it was a organized graveyard. It wasn't just a mass pit that you just throw bodies in and throw lie on top of. So it's the personal grave part. The, the idea of allowing Jesus to not be put in the Sanhedrin's graveyard of the condemned, which was actually contrary to Jewish law, to, to allow a convict to be buried honorably would have violated the Mishnah, uh, essentially. So, so that, that was strange, but you, you, I suppose you could imagine the Romans being paid off. Maybe Joseph of Arimathea bought, you know, bribed Pilate to allow, I, I don't know, they didn't show that in the movie, so it, it wouldn't just so casually happen like that. Um, but they did kind of portray Clavius being surprised at it, so they did at least establish that there was something weird about like, like what you get to bury the body in your own grave. That's kind of strange. So they at least acknowledged that it wasn't normal. Or maybe Pilate wanted to control the body so that it couldn't be stolen. Yeah, at least, but see, good writers would put that in, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So speaking of the body in the tomb, um, it, you know, not all of the first half to me was, was that credible. I mean, that there's a really silly scene with these two guards that were posted at the, tomb i mean they they were something like something out of a comic book they were like beavis and butthead sitting there <laughs> sitting there hiding liquor under their robes so they could you know they could get drunk and fall asleep so that this thing could happen and i mean is that plausible that roman guards would be that sloppy with their duties it, it's it's remotely plausible in the sense that any armed force can have that kind of situation. And they did write it as though they, the soldiers were already grumpy that they were supposed to have the day off and, or the, the weekend off. And so they were forced to do this thing and they were supposed to have rations brought to them, but Clavius forgot and didn't send. So they, they kind of set up the narrative where these soldiers are just pissed off and it's like, fuck this job kind of attitude. Yeah. Um, and that could have happened. It, it wouldn't have been a normal behavior, but it, but in any military, you, you might have, you know, screw ups who do something like this. Uh, and, and you have, we have some stories from like Apuleius who writes about the behavior of Roman soldiers and they weren't always on the up and up. Um, but usually you would get the, your ass kicked, right? You would get beaten or killed for doing this. And they did correctly show in the movie 
that the soldiers were so afraid of being executed for what they had done that they were literally like like Julian Assange. They were hiding <laughs> in the temple. <laughs> they were hiding in the temple, and the Jews were protecting them uh, in a place where the Romans couldn't go. And so they were they were literally like hiding out in the temple to keep themselves from being killed, and then ran away. Eventually, I think they established on the plot. So yeah. So that, that at least they acknowledged that there was something that the Romans would not have treated that lightly and so they, they did make that plausible in the law in in the whole scheme of things so one of the things about this that bothers me not just in the movie but in the biblical account as well is uh the fact that if the if the roman soldiers had actually seen the resurrection like like in the movie he saw this light and he saw it happen right well why wasn't he a believer then I mean, if you had been there and you had seen this blinding light in the tomb open and the body come out, I mean, wouldn't you have converted right on the spot? Yeah. Well, you know, I have thoughts about that. See, the thing is, I would mention the sorcery aspect of it earlier. See, the thing is, you have to realize that these are not modern Center for Inquiry skeptics, <laughs> right? These are like, like pagan. They even show Clavius praying to the gods. He's a pagan, right? So they have their own superstitious beliefs. They believe that there are things like sorcerers that can do stuff. And, and one, of the, one of the stock abilities of the sorcerer is to raise the dead. Uh, it's like they have a list of things that sor good sorcerers can do. Raising the dead is on the, on the list. Um, and all of the things that Jesus does in this, like teleportation, um, heal, you know, mirac miraculous faith healing on touch, um, you know, re even resurrection, uh, creating a blinding light, like uh, flying in the sky, like all of these things were standard sorcerer capabilities, but they're not god-like abilities. I mean, a god would not just like. Here's what Jesus does: he randomly, accidentally, almost absent-mindedly stumbles into one random leper and heals him, and that's it. Then it's like, wow, that's amazing. It's like, yeah, but that's that's sorcerers can do that. I mean, a god would just cure leprosy, right? Like, I mean, all leprosy, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, leprosy would no longer exist on the earth. Like that that would that's what a god does. An ordinary sorcerer just yeah, oh oh look this guy, let me touch him and heal him. Like that's not a that's not an exercise of godlike power. That's an exercise of human sorcery kind of power. So this character, his first hypothesis, once he started realizing supernatural stuff was going on, his first hypothesis would have been this guy's a sorcerer. And then he, so his question would be like, well, where do your powers come from? And they would be making these claims about, oh, he's sent from God. And it's like, well, you got to convince me of that. Like he could be completely accepting of all the supernatural stuff he'd seen. And he wouldn't immediately jump to, oh, this is God. Uh, he, he would he would meet, he would have a lot of other available pagan superstitious scenarios that he could work through before he'd get there. It's only like a modern person that has this absolute dichotomy. It's either a miracle from God or it's natural physics. That's a modern view. That that is not a view that would have been taken by many people in the ancient world. Well, then in that in that context, then a, a resurrection would not have been such a big deal. Then in that context. no, not really. Uh, I mean, not really from from that perspective, right? Because they they have other supernatural explanations of that. They could accept the supernatural without having to assume that it has to be the one explanation that Christians are giving for it. Um, and so, a good writers would have worked that in. Like they would have to have persuaded him of that next step. Like like, okay, you accept the supernatural is going on. Let us now convince you of what the actual causes are, of what's actually going on here. But they never explain anything. They never try to explain why God raised Jesus from the dead, why that was even necessary. There's even a scene where where uh, Jesus, where he, where Clavius is talking to Jesus, and he he sort of hints at like, why did you have to die or something like that, and. Jesus is silent. Like that's the one moment where he could explain to him the atonement theology is like, actually, you know what? I actually had to, I know you were there at my, at my death and I actually had to die. And here's why. No, it's not in there. It's this bizarre that Jesus just clams up. and doesn't even explain what the point of any of it is <laughs> to this one guy. And he's sitting there. He's nothing else to do. Like, this is like the perfect opportunity. Well, cause, cause Richard, there's a scene earlier in the movie where Clavius asks Peter, why doesn't Jesus just show his miracles to everyone and convince all of us of the, of his truth? And then, so that really annoyed me then when he has Jesus, he's just hanging with Jesus all night and he doesn't ask him those sorts of questions when he has him right yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, there's that part of it too. Um, the other thing was that, that ties into this is they have that one, the one crucial linchpin scene where Clavius is still hunting them down and he breaks into that one room and he sees Jesus and he recognizes the corpse that was on the cross and, he, and, he, and he, then he's stunned like he's, 
you know, been struck with a great blow and he can barely reason coherently and tells Lucius to go away and all of this stuff. And, uh, but the thing is, is like, what would have happened in reality if someone had done that? Their first hypothesis would be, holy shit, Jesus has a twin brother, right? Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't immediately go to, oh my God, he rose from the dead. So like, before you even get to the raising from, raising from the dead part, what, what would have convinced him is when Jesus vanished right in front of his eyes. That was the moment where you could say, oh, okay, that's not a twin. That's something else. Yeah, um, that's that's mirrors. Yeah, huh. yeah, or, or something, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, the twin, the twin idea is one hypothesis. The Didymus idea that, that that's Jesus right. might have had a twin. Yeah, Didymus Thomas. Both those words mean twin. So Thomas actually means twin. Didymus means twin. Um, yeah, there was a hypothesis that there was Jesus got replaced with a twin. Uh, even in you know even in antiquity that was around, but. Um, that to me was the first writing, serious writing fail where the plot just went off the rails and it was unrecoverable at that point. When Clavius reacts as though he immediately assumes this is the resurrected body of Jesus and not his, not a twin, where he doesn't ask further questions like, whoa, what's going on here? He's just stunned into silence and disbelief, yada, yada. That was a bad, that was bad writing, actually, in my opinion. And then almost right after that, and then Jesus disappears, and Mary then, for the first time, explains to the disciples what Jesus told her when she first saw him after the resurrection. And I'm thinking, wait, she didn't tell him them this before? <laughs> like, there's no way she wouldn't have, she would have said, oh, Jesus, I met Jesus, like, right after the, the body disappeared, and he told me some stuff, uh, but I, it's not important, I'll tell you later. Like, that's not, <laughs> she would have already have told the disciples that information. So, and, and that's when the, like, things just got worse from there. And, and when, when uh, Clavius they're they're running away from this Roman manhunt, and him Clavius is trying to has joined the disciples, and he's trying to get them through in, in this little canyon thing, and he meets Lucius, who's hunting them down, and somehow convinces Lucius to let them go, to let them escape. That scene is so implausibly written; it made absolutely no sense. They made no clear reason why Lucius was agreeing to let them go. Like he didn't try to convince him of anything. He didn't explain anything. Like there was no the the motivation of Lucius, the character there, just just was not written into the story, and that, that really upset me as a writer. <laughs> it was so terrible, and that's okay, all in the I, second um, half. But but I kind of got that. Not, I, I agree with you. The writing was bad, but it was a scene where uh, he says to um, his sidekick, uh, "There will be no more killing. There will be no killing today." Right. And, and 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 in my mind he was like appealing to some spiritual thing, let's stop the killing because I'm Jesus and you're not gonna kill me, you know. So <laughs> it's kinda of, it's kinda of woo woo and then yeah. he gets Well Jesus wasn't look. there, it was just Clavius and the disciples. But yeah, yeah. that, yeah, that yeah. could have been I mean, like you could work that, but the writers just didn't the writers just didn't work that. So can, can, let's go back to this Galilee thing. I think the reason Mary didn't say that until after the upper room scene was that uh, the New Testament accounts themselves are contradictory. If you read Matthew, <laughs> yeah. in yeah. Matthew, Galilee is the first appearance, mm-hmm. and, and if Mark, you read Matthew, even in Mark, it says yeah. that's where it will be. Yeah, and so they, and you know, in Matthew, you know, Jesus, Jesus said it at the Last Supper, and then, uh, then at the tomb, uh, go, go tell his disciples to go to Galilee. There they, then there you will see him. So they immediately go to Galilee, and some doubted. So obviously Matthew wanted that to be the first appearance, not this yeah. upper room appearance. That's right. But, yeah. But the movie, the, the writers had no choice because it's hopelessly contradictory. So they stuck the <laughs> upper room experience first so they could get that out of the way. And then they could have this hike up to Galilee, which would have I would take uh, t- would have taken days. It would have taken days. Walking. Yeah, it would have been days by, by, by foot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was curious, Richard, about the. I was just curious about the investigation. This because they they sort of structure this as like a CSI kind of investigation, yeah. <laughs> and this and that is, was neat. I was getting into that. I thought that was cool. But so Clavius is a, is a military tribune, which I, I gather is, is like a general. No, it's it's more. Uh, it, the, the parallels aren't exact to our military system. Um, so there's a difference between a military tribune and a tribune of the people. Um, they're, they're radically different in social class. Uh, so a military tribune is really just a centurion who has, uh, who is kind of like one rank above the top ranking centurion. And the way the legions were organized, you'd have 6,000 troops and you, they'd be organized into centuries, which is units of a hundred men. And six of those together is a cohort. So six, six centuries is one cohort and 600 men. And there'd be a centurion for each hundred men. That's where the word centurion comes from. So, um, 
you would have uh, a centurion for each hundred. And then, so you'd have, uh, you know, 60 centurions and they would rank from one to 60. So you'd have the supreme centurion would be the, the most experienced or highest ranking of them all. But then above the centurions, you would have the military tribune who was kind of like the officer in charge of all the troops, but he's still the same social class as Pontius Pilate. They're still equestrian class, the equivalent of a knight. Um, where they, they're, they're rich enough to own a horse, you know, theoretically, uh, but are not of sufficient social class to be a senator. Now, generals would be senators. They'd be of the senatorial class. So they would be much higher ranking socially. And it, there weren't any, there, there would have been one of those people it, governing the whole province of Syria, of which Judea was one part of Syria, but they'd be busy governing Syria, right? So they wouldn't really be running the, the military. The military would be spread out and assigned to, into units to different prefects and to different uh tribunes of the of the military like these two guys so really uh pontius pilate and clavius are kind of like almost equal social rank um technically clavius has to obey pilate because pilate's in charge of that region and that was really the only command relationship that they had but otherwise you notice in the movie they did accurately portray them as pilate treated him a lot like a social equal uh throughout the whole movie and that that was plausible because they were kind of at the same level and they were both uh, just at the rank where they could have been elevated to senatorial class. Like that, that was kind of an ambition that people at that rank might have had. And that was all plausible. And, and they even built that into the story. The first half of the story, they actually, it was very believable the way they wrote that relationship and their ambitions and all of that. But Pilate was given orders. Pilate was definitely giving the orders at least. Yeah, for sure. Because he was in charge of that province. Uh, yeah. and, but you notice also Clavius seemed annoyed by this <laughs> <laughs> a lot. And it was that's the reality is that Clavius did have to take his orders, but he's taking orders from a social equal. So that, that was slightly annoying. And they did, uh, you know, Joe Fines actually portrayed that, the acting of that pretty well. I guess what I'm wondering, though, is would they have had anything analogous to police detectives who would be used to interrogating suspects and things like that is it is it realistic someone that high up would be doing like personally going around on the street and in, interrogating all those people yes uh in fact he's not very high up um for, to give you an example we have we have an actual case similar to this um which is Pliny the younger when he was and he was senatorial class which is the, the topest rank the highest rank in, in the roman ranks uh he was senatorial class and he was the governor of what is now turkey um uh, he was uh governing that region and uh or part of turkey and he um was a special governor there and we have an account where he actually says he himself was conducting personal interrogations and investigations of christians in his area at the time uh, and that he was personally interrogating them so that's that's someone of of much higher rank doing that um and it would totally make sense for Pliny to have sent uh people of the equestrian class who's you know soldiers officers of lower rank to go round people up, to go investigate things, go find people, go find a missing body if they thought there was a stolen body. Um, you know, if someone had robbed a, uh, you know, a Roman carriage full of gold or something, they would send someone to go find it, right? So they did have that, but they would be soldiers generally. They weren't, they weren't dedicated police detectives. They didn't have police departments per se. Um, so they would be soldiers tasked with these, these special missions that they'd be sent to do. And so the way they depicted it in the movie is plausible. Yeah, I would agree. What did you make of the scene, Richard, where Clavius prays to his little statue and kind of offers a prayer to Yahweh? I actually liked that. Um, that was interesting because they showed him earlier praying to Mars and he then mentioned to him that he prayed to Mars. That was his favorite god. Um, and, and Pilate says his favorite god was, was goddess Minerva. Um, but, uh, so they show him that. And so he, he's feeling at, at, uh, you know, uh, at freight ends, right? He's, he's, he's figuring like, I, I need some help here. So he's figuring I need divine help. A pagan would think to turn to the gods and it would make sense for a pagan to say, well, you know, the God of this region is this particular storm God, Yahweh or whatever. I'm going to pray to him. And it was, so that that's believable. And it was interesting that the way he did it was completely wrong. It's where he, he, he was doing it in a devotional sense, the, uh, what's, or a votive sense. So pagan religion, the way it would work is you would give something to the god, like gold or something like that, and say, hey, I'll give you this present if you give me the thing I want. Uh, and that's called votive religion. And that's not really the way uh, Jewish religion worked. And so for him to pray to Yahweh and say, here's some gold coins, uh, and I will... Oh, and he said, I think he said, I will build a temple... And and do something else on in your oh and hold games in your honor, <laughs> mm. <laughs> which totally makes sense for a pagan to say that, and it made sense for a pagan to not understand that Yahweh would not like either of those things. 
<laughs> and I think the writers knew that. Like the way they wrote that, they knew that there's no way a pig or no way that, that a Jew would ever say, I'm gonna give money to Yahweh and promise I'll build him a temple and and have gladiatorial games in his honor <laughs> if he'll do me a nice favor. Like like that's so un Jewish. Uh, and so yeah. but it is very pagan. So it, it, it was a nice I, touch. Yeah, I found that funny. I laughed at that scene because it, it made a lot of sense for the character and it was like he's so clueless about Jewish religion. Um, so that was actually good. I actually like that. Uh-huh. I mean, Dan, are there any other ways in which this deviated from the Gospels or, or what did you think in addition to what we talked about, about how true this stayed to the Gospel account? Well, the Gospel accounts don't stay true to themselves. So, I mean, it's kind of, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah, fair point. But uh, they're, you know, they're all over the place. They contradict. But um uh, one tiny example is um, toward the end where Jesus tells Clavius, uh, you have seen and believed, but blessed are they who have not seen and yet believed. Right. That's, that was actually spoken to Thomas back in Jerusalem, to Daddy yeah. Thomas. So they're they're taking some of the lines, but they're giving them to different people uh, at different times in the story. So I don't know if that's a serious problem for theology, but it does show the movie making going on. Yeah, and when you're writing historical fiction, um that's i find that clever when you because you can imagine like if the way the writers are trying to sell this is that this is what really happened and then decades later people wrote the story down and they get things screwed up right so like the this something that jesus actually said to clavius gets said to this thomas guy right so they create a scene and the the the, the saying gets moved into a different scenario situation that's plausible like you you could it seemed like that's what they're doing they're trying to pick a version of events that could explain the evolution of the contradictory legends later on. Did you think it was bizarre that Clavius played such a big role in this story and never got mentioned in the Gospels? Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, that's hard to explain. Uh, another questionable uh, scene was the location of the Ascension, because the New Testament has the Ascension of Jesus in different places, right? Uh, on the Mount of Olives or near Jerusalem. But here it happens right up there in Galilee as he's walking into the... I guess he's walking east, isn't he? Walking right into Supposedly, the Supposedly, yeah. He's walking towards an oversized sun and then he vanishes and there's a big blast of wind and light. They don't actually show him going up into space. No. Um, I was waiting for that to happen. I was waiting for them to see him fly up into outer space like uh, like some horror movie or something. That, that would have been awesome. But but no, they had this stupid this light show with the big like nuclear blast kind of like micro, miniature nuclear blast wave of wind, which made no sense. I don't even know where they got that idea. That's not in any of the, the Gospels or even the Apocrypha, as far as I know. How about stuff? There was like kind of odd stuff in here, too. Like there, there was the thing that kind of looks like the Shroud of Turin. Yes, that was interesting. Clearly, they were trying to play off of that idea of the Shroud of Turin. And but notice in the movie he gave a uh like a rational like he he scullied it right so he gave a scully explanation but it was just it was just sweat and and herbs right the the sweat and spices um and and they never really made anything else out of it after that point they didn't try to portray it as supernatural that's actually one of the interesting things about the first half of the movie is that nothing was explicitly supernatural in the first half like they would have weird coincidences like they would have that image on the shroud they had the the ropes were broken weirdly, and there was an earthquake, and there was clouds covering the sun. That's how they explained the darkness at the crucifixion. But they were all everything had a natural explanation, like they, they like it was all had a, this alternative explanation. So they're doing a really good job of creating this sort of ambiguity between is this a supernatural thing or is this just a natural coincidence? And and I love it when they do that. That's a really clever thing to do. And it was only when Jesus finally vanishes from the room that they start doing some they start doing things that are clearly have no natural explanation they're clearly supernatural and that's in the second half of the film but the first half i thought was really clever for the way they were doing that uh having all of these sort of things in there that were it could be interpreted as miracles but aren't explicitly so it would have been neat if they'd kept that up so where it was ambiguous by the end of the movie and the one they weren't sure i would love to see the second half of the movie where Jesus does some things that have natural explanations, but you're not sure. And that, and he disappears, but they're not sure if it was supernatural or not. Like, so that there's an ambiguity as to whether he really was who he said he was. And that would have been much better writing, I guess. But I don't know. Maybe I'm writing my own movie in my. <laughs> and the earthquake happened, but there was no comment about it. It's just this That's huge right. earthquake, and these buildings are cracking. I mean, that would have been a, a major event. Yeah. And 
And then the, <laughs> in the Bible, it, one of the gospels says that the stone was rolled away because an earthquake rolled the stone away at a, at a different time. If there was an earthquake large enough to roll a stone like that away, there would have been massive deaths and homes destroyed and people needing to yes. be tended. There would have been, a, you know what I mean? And yet everybody's yeah. casually, casually walking around afterwards like, oh, well, it was just yeah. an earthquake. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing is like there's no – like Pontius Pilate's first task would be like emergency relief and stuff. Like this would be a major – you know, uh, a relief effort, like soldiers would be too busy taking care of people and buildings and stuff like that. So yeah, you're totally right. If that earthquake had actually occurred, it would have completely changed the course of events. But that's the same problem in the Bible, biblical account. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Know? And so the next day they're walking casually to Emmaus and the women are coming. You know, an earthquake like that would have, would have been noticed. Yes. <laughs> by somebody. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. I want to pick up though on what you were just saying, Richard, about I, I totally agree with you that I think this movie would have been a lot stronger if they had kept it ambiguous throughout the whole movie, whether there were any anything supernatural going on. Or maybe I was thinking just like the, the Book of Eli, that movie, if something, it was ambiguous all the way through. And then just at the end, there was just one kind of kicker where yes. you see something supernatural. Well, yeah, that see, that would be the point. That would have been the time to have Jesus vanish, right? Like like the way uh, – and oh, here's another spoiler for Battlestar Galactica for those who haven't seen the series. <laughs> Warning. Uh, when they have uh, um, Starbuck uh, says – standing behind Apollo saying, you know, I feel like – I feel like I'm completed. I feel like I'm done. And he turns around and she's gone. She's just vanished. And that's it. That's the end. That's like – so some sort of angelic figure, she just vanishes. That would have been good. Like if they'd had – like everything was ambiguous up to that point and then they, then they had this – this un inexplicable scene where Jesus just literally vanishes before their eyes. And that would be like, whoa, okay, what now? Right? So that, that would have been a really great way to end the film. Now I don't have to see Battlestar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's the, the series, the new, oh, the new okay. series. Uh, what did you guys think of the decision to make Mary Magdalene a prostitute? Because I, I thought that that was kind of had fallen out of favor in scholarship. It, it has, because that was a later legend. It, it's not in the original New Testament. Yeah, and you know there was a moment of humor early in the movie that I almost yes. laughed out loud. Except <laughs> here, this I saw the movie on opening night in Madison, Wisconsin. There were five people in the theater, including me, and three of them were just really old people. I mean, it was like no one really cared. But yeah, there were only about eight in the theater when we went, and half of us were atheists. So, <laughs> um, so but uh, when they're when they're trying to find Mary Magdalene. And uh, I think he's, I think he goes to talk to the prisoners. He goes into yeah. jail. Does, does no, no, anybody no, he, know no, Mary no, Magdalene? He, he went to the barracks, the Roman barracks. Oh, that's right. Soldiers. He said, does anybody yeah. know Mary Magdalene? And then half the hands shot up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's because, oh, yeah, we know. <laughs> yeah, because Lucius, because he, he, he wants to find Mary Magdalene to interrogate her because she supposedly saw Jesus the first of all the people and knew the disciples. And so he tells Lucius, you got to get me this Mary person. And Lucy says, how am I supposed to find this, you know, random prostitute? And he says, oh, a prostitute. And then they, he, he walks him to the barracks and he opens the door and says, who here knows Mary Magdalene? And that was the thing they all their hands. And he just grabs someone and says, okay, you, you, because they, so they got them and they had the, him identify her by sight. So I was like, is that her? Yes. Okay. And so that, which made sense. Like, that's what you would do in that situation. That's how you would find her. That, that makes me think, I mean, if you say that half the audience was atheists, who is this movie for? I mean, because my, my reaction after watching it was, I, this seems to me only for, for Christians. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone who's not a Christian, I wouldn't think. But I don't know. Yeah. What, do you, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, I, it, only because of the failure of the second half of the film, it's just not worth watching. Uh, it, had it kept up the writing that was in the first half of the film, I totally would recommend it. it. Even if it went to the whole, even if they had a whole preachy gospel thing at the end, I would still recommend it to atheists. Had the last half been well written. Um, but it just wasn't. Uh, so, uh, what's it written for? I, and see, the, this is the thing that I've been trying to figure out is why did they never explain the gospel? There's no point where they ever explain the gospel. They never use any of the marker points. So they don't talk about prophecy. They don't talk about the apocalypse. They don't talk about, uh, the atonement. They don't talk about sin. They don't talk about hell. Um, uh, they don't even explain exactly how eternal life, they talk about eternal life has something to do with it, but they never explain how or how you get eternal life or any of it. Um, they don't talk about the moral values, um, it, other than just sort of a vague niceness. Uh, so, so it seemed to me like they were deliberately avoiding any of these things in order to try and appeal to all Christian sects. Cause if you picked one particular theory of the atonement, 
that might alienate certain segments of the Christian uh, audience. So I'm wondering if they were trying to appeal to Catholics as well as Protestants and to all different sects. And, and this was their way of doing it, which was just not a really good way of doing it. Um, I, I don't know. That's just a hypothesis. Otherwise, I can't explain why they never had any actual Christian material in the movie. Or maybe they were trying not to be too preachy. Just to pique our interest in this guy who actually yeah, rose from the dead. That could be, you know, that could be yeah. too. Like sell it as the hippie love Jesus. And then people go, oh, hey, this Christianity thing seems groovy. Let's look into it. That could be. I don't know. Yeah. Well, no, that's what I was just about to say is that if they had gone into the theology at all, you would have started getting stuff like hell and damnation and that's right. very sin. divisive things. Yes. Sin and judgment. Yeah. Right. But I mean, it just seems like this is a problem you have when you have this. 2000 year old story and you're presenting it to a modern audience is that there's just things that just don't come across well to a modern audience i mean that one thing yeah, that really struck true. struck me is that um all of jesus's disciples are all men and it always there's a shot of all of them together i couldn't help thinking of the the dwarves from the hobbit <laughs> um but but that really struck me seeing it on screen that they're all men there's no women present at all really felt um yeah not modern <laughs> right yeah there's just mary but uh but yeah, yeah, they didn't have any other women attendants or anything like that. Okay, but Peter, Peter was, I liked Peter. He was a kind of Tevia character, you know? Yeah, uh, that's true. A, a, a bigger, older guy. His acting was a bit better than I think those other kids. Absolutely. Were yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. He was much better than Bartholomew, the, the actor who played Bartholomew. Um, yeah, his, his performance was convincing. It just, he wasn't given very good material to work with. So he, he was doing... Which actually really is a testament to the actor, his performance ability, that he was able to pull off some good acting with, with some pretty bad writing. <laughs> yeah, and then at the end where uh, Jesus tells him to catch the fish on the other side of the boat. You know, there's you're out in this ocean or this lake, big Sea of Galilee. And on one side of a boat, there's no fish, but on the other side of the boat, there is. So Jesus knew what side to tell him. And they pull in this net full of fish. And I was hoping they were going to say the number. The, right, you know, yeah. The, yes, you know, because of the them. whole Gnostic yeah. idea of that. that, <laughs> But they didn't. That was, yeah, I think it was yeah. 153, wasn't it? Yes, in the Gospel of John, uh, and it is a Galilee uh, post-resurrection experience where they, they yeah. do this big catch of fish. It's actually a lift from Luke 11. It's actually a story that occurs in the life of Jesus that the authors of John moved to the, as a, into a resurrection story. And um, yeah, they get all these fish and they count them and there's 153 fish and it's never explained why the number is relevant or important. Uh, Jerome uh, centuries later said that the significance of it was that there was the, the common lore was that there was 153 species of fish. Um, that doesn't line up with the science books of antiquity, but uh, there could have been the fisherman's lore of 153 species of fish. And, and the point of it was that they would get a select number of converts from all the tribes of man, in other words, for all the nations. And so it was a, a sort of prediction of the end times will come when they've gotten their, when God has gotten his elect from all the different nations of man. And so it's 153 fishes, uh, species of fish. Those are the fish, of course, fishers of men. So fish represent men. They represent the tribes of man. Anyway, that, that's what Jerome said. It's as plausible an explanation as any. Uh, there are others that have to do with the sort of Gnostic idea of Pythagorean perfect number uh, and other things like that, which is not, they, they are not mutually exclusive. They could have meant all the same thing together. And that number was related to the intersecting circles, which would have made a fish symbol. So there are some people who think that's right. Yeah. That, that the, the Gnostic writer of John was inserting the answer to the mathematical riddle into that story. Yeah, and so that's as, that's another plausibility, I guess. But we we don't yeah. really know, and it could be all yeah. of those things, right? They they yeah. could have intended all of those things at the same time. But it's not in the movie. So they, missed <laughs> no. that, they missed their shot. That would have been neat, but oh well. Yeah. Well, you guys mentioned that you liked Peter, and I I agree. And I think one thing that the movie, the second half, did well, as far as it goes, is that it it presented this early Christian community as kind of appealing. These people who all are having a good time and like each other. And, you know, I, I think that, I think it did a good job of capturing what's appealing to a lot of people about religion is that sense of community. Yeah. Except they left all their families, their wives and children to, to follow this guy around the dusty, dusty hillsides there, you know, and, and never really, I know they never really talk about anything. They never, I, I yeah, it's, it's, they did not do a good job of explaining why they cared. Uh, 
other than like I said that he's a he's a nice guy who can do magic tricks. That was like that was really the only thing that they it was the only motivation they established for the disciples. And and surely they're intending there to be more motivation there, but the writers just didn't put it in. So you, you're kind of mystified as to what am I supposed to take away from this? Uh, all right. Is there anything else, anything else positive we can say about the movie? Um, Hey, I'm, I'm praising that first half. It's, it reminds me of uh, uh, the TV show lost where if you watch the whole series up just before the last episode, you should stop there and you should not watch the last episode because it's a, that's a huge disappointment and you could write, you could stop just before the last episode and write your own ending. And it would be anything you wrote would be better <laughs> than the actual ending. And so this movie's kind of like that. You can watch the first half. And as soon as they start interrogating Mary Magdalene, um, just turn it off and then write your own ending to the rest of the movie. <laughs> and whatever you write will be better than what these writers came up with. Well, that's interesting you say that, Richard, because, I mean, part of the reason the ending of Lost is so unsatisfying is because they went in this totally random religious direction with it. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. I mean, you know, this the story of Jesus is often described as the, like, quote unquote, greatest story ever told. Um, yeah. But it doesn't seem to me a particularly interesting story from a just from a writing standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> because That's fair, yeah. Because because of the lack of conflict, sort of that that you you know if you know that every all the good people will be rewarded and all the bad people will be punished, everything's in God's hands no matter what. It's not kind of sucks all this tension out of any kind of dramatic situation. Yeah, yeah, and that's where having the ambiguity, if they if they went with the ambiguous, is it supernatural or not throughout the rest of it, that could create the tension to where you're not sure was this some sort of was this the son of God. Or was it not? Like, get you to that point where it's literally you're not sure one way or the other. Where you can't just say, oh, yeah, that was all just magic tricks. And you can't say, oh, yeah, he's the son of God. Where you can say, like, ah, it could go either way. I don't know. Like, that would be a really well-written conclusion yeah, to and, the film. And I, when I was a preacher, I would have said exactly that. What, what Jesus said to Thomas, blessed are they who have not seen and yet believed. So to leave it ambiguous so that you have to make a choice of whether you're going to believe or not. There is, I mean, I mean, as an atheist, that's a silly concept. But as a believer, there is some some cachet yeah. there. There's some, you know, uh, you have to you have to take a step and make that extra step to decide whether you believe this or not. Yeah, yeah. Also, there's one other line I wanted to ask you guys about, and it was in the trailer too, so it's a pretty big part of the movie. But there's a part where Clav uh, Jesus asks Clavius what he fears most, and Clavius says, "Uh." my soul basically wagering eternity on on having wrong beliefs that's it yeah and i read one being, review being wrong that's what he said is that yeah but yeah right, yeah yeah and I, I read one review that said that that's completely anachronistic that a, a roman pagan of this period wouldn't think in those terms whatsoever i was just probably. curious what you thought about that yeah probably not uh or at least not that rapidly like they would have had to have gotten him to that point right like they would have to explain all this stuff and things would have to have convinced him of their particular theology um yeah it, it, you could think in terms of like the movie gladiator where the the sort of afterlife belief that was portrayed uh of um uh, maximus and and that in that film that character that was more like what pagans would assume is the case and so they never really explain why clavius would be concerned about whether he would end up in some sort of Elysium or not. Um, they don't, they, and, and of course they don't also don't talk about his religion beyond like, uh, was he a member of a mystery cult or anything like that? Uh, so the fact that he's not would suggest that he might think that, well, I might just go to the Isle of the Blessed or something. And, and uh, like, like they might not, or, or sleep in the grave. Like there, there's, there are different theologies within paganism in terms of what people believed would happen to them. Uh, and we have that on epitaphs. So we know there's a, a variety of beliefs as to what people thought would happen to them after their death. But for him to be concerned about heaven or hell and it all being hinging on a belief, like the belief is what decides one way or the other, um, that's alien to paganism. And so the only way that he would ever be in that position is he had to have, there had to be a character arc, a story arc that would get him from the pagan mindset to that particular Jewish mindset of you. Ha it's based on faith in a particular deity that is going to decide the question as to whether you go to hell or heaven. Um, or go to heaven or, or rot in the grave or whatever the case may be. And they just, they just didn't develop that story arc. And that, that's something they could have done in the second half of the film also, and they didn't. Well, in fact, there's even a line where Pontius Pilate points to a dead body and says, 
that's us in a couple years or something, right. which to be strongly suggested they were materialists, which... Yeah, and that is also very common, especially for people of their social status. Um, in fact, the picture of a skull or a skull or a skeleton was very common in pagan art to remind people that, yeah, we're all just going to be bones someday. And we have epitaphs where that's where people say like, like, yeah, we're not sleep. We're not, a, we're not awake. We're not in heaven or anything like that. We're just bones. Uh, but we also have epitaphs where people think that they're, they're going to some sort of blessed place. So, uh, so there was diversity of belief among pagans, but the more you got up into the more educated classes, the, the more you ended up with, like you said, the materialistic view that, yeah, we're just going to be corpses and, and that's it. Uh, so there were people who thought that, uh, and, and so that's plausible to have someone like, um, Pilate say that, but they don't have Clavius give him an answer, right? So Pilate says that, but then Clavius gives him a look and then leaves. So you don't really know what Clavius's personal views are uh, at that point. Well, looking at the movie through the eyes of the believer that I used to be, I would take that line of his as an indication that Clavius is one of these special people whose spiritual values are waking up like like all christians should be you know right here on the on the cusp of history in the roman empire and jesus is coming and here's sort of the birth of that longing for something more than just the old pagan way so that's kind of how i saw it you know aren't we christians yeah. special? we we christians get it you know when the pagans uh -huh. didn't yeah yeah well i mean speaking of the looking at it through the eyes of a christian i mean we're all pretty you know have pretty mixed feelings about this movie, but I just from looking online, it seems like the, a lot of Christians are really responding to this movie. I don't know if you, did you guys look at any responses from Christians? Or what did you think of those? I looked at some. I, did, I haven't seen too many. Um, and and even the ones that I looked at, it wasn't entirely clear why they liked the film. Yeah, I read one, and I forget who it was. I think it was Christian News, who pointed out the problems, but said. These problems are not big enough. The inaccuracies aren't enough to get in the way of the truth. So enjoy the movie. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I could talk about Roman stuff and religion all day long, but we're uh, coming up on time here. I guess, uh, Dan, do you have any, any, or Dan or Richard, do you have any just final thoughts on this movie? Anything else you didn't get a chance to say? The popcorn was good, but my milk does were stale, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we've covered it all. Okay, and so, Dan, I did want to give you a chance to talk about your new book, uh, God, the Most Unpleasant Character in All Fiction. Uh, just tell us a little bit about that. It just came out this month, and it was sort of an accident. Uh, Richard Dawkins asked me to help him document his famous sentence about the God of the Old Testament is the most unpleasant character uh, in all fiction, and he always gets a laugh when he says that. And then he lists these 19 nasty adjectives, jealous and infanticidal and genocidal, misogynistic, and so on. So uh, as we were gathering documentation, because he wanted to make a slide, you know, like a PowerPoint or a keynote slide, uh, I, it, it came up to over 1,500 verses. And then he had the idea, this would make a good book, pun intended, a good book. And so he said, why don't you make each of these adjectives a chapter of its own and document the the uh, Old Testament. So I did, and part one of the book is called uh, Dawkins Was Right, 19 chapters with each of those adjectives. But I found some that he overlooked, or maybe he didn't overlook it, he just thought 19 was enough. But, <laughs> so I, part two of the book is called Dawkins Was Too Kind. And so I have uh, eight more adjectives, uh, including angry, merciless, cannibalistic, aborticidal, uh, slave monger. He didn't talk about slave monger. So uh, it just came out, and a final chapter, of course, Christians are always going to say you can't judge the Bible by the Old Testament alone, and they're right if you consider the Bible to be an intact book. So the final chapter is what about Jesus, and, and where I basically point out that Jesus claimed, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, I, you know, I think the New Testament was a colossal missed opportunity. Jesus could have come along and said, hey, I apologize. My father was a jerk, but we're going to do things better now. But he didn't. He quoted him with, with praise and approval, and he claimed to be that same person. So, uh, And it's doing really well. The book is uh, up in the top five or so uh, atheist books. And it's actually in the top three to three to two to three or four or five um, Bible criticism books, which is pretty interesting. I mean, yeah, I just read the chapter on Jesus, and it kind of struck me that Jesus says something like, if you're not anyone who isn't with me is against me, which— yeah. uh, you know, it's the same thing Anakin Skywalker says when he becomes Darth Vader. So I thought yeah. that was interesting. That's like uh, the, the paranoia of a kind of small town cult leader. 
you know, not understanding neutrality. If you're not with me, you're against me, you know. Uh, so, so cannibalistic is one of the, one of these yeah, adjectives? There's, there's nine verses in the Old Testament where God either threatens or says that what will happen to you. In fact, this is one example of true gender equality in the Bible, where, where God says, you shall eat the flesh of your sons and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. So there, there's some egalitarianism in the Bible. Uh, but yeah, there's, a, there's nine of those in there. And then aborticidal as well, where the pregnant women shall be ripped open. And so if you're debating somebody about the moral qualities of the Old Testament God, uh, it's a handy list of, you know, just stack, stack upon stack of verses that, you know, maybe they could weasel out of one or two of them. But when there's 1,500, <laughs> that, really, that really shows you what he's like. How long did it take you to compile 1,500 violent verses? Well, it took uh, 16 months of getting up before 5 a.m. Uh, and, uh, and then I had to cut, I had to cut for some reason. And even Richard Dawkins, as he was going, we were going through it, he said, you know, maybe you shouldn't include this. And he was suggesting ways that I should soften the book, you know, here, here he's been accused of being this strident, you know, contentious person. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it took about 16 months. And then, uh, the, then the editing process from, um, from the publisher. All right. Well, it's, yeah, it's a very, uh, very interesting book. So everyone go check it out. It's called God, the Most Unpleasant Character in All Fiction. I also kind of, I was just curious, Dan, you know, I, as I was uh, doing some research, I just came across a picture of your wife, uh, Annie Laurie Gaylor, standing next to Isaac Asimov. And I was just kind of curious what kind of connections you guys had with science fiction. Oh, well, uh, I read it and Annie Laurie once in a while reads it. She likes uh, Ursula K. Le Guin. Uh, and, but they were both invited to a humanist conference to give a talk, and so they were on the same program. So that's where that picture came from. And he was very likable, and they had a good time. That was before I met her. So, uh, yeah. All right, cool. And so how about Richard? Uh, what have you been up to since we last talked to you? Well, I've been promoting my book on the historicity of Jesus, mainly. Uh, and uh, I've I've just now starting uh, the finishing touches on some more books that will be coming out starting later this year. Um, my upcoming books, they're not out yet, but they're going to be on ancient science. Uh, so I'm finally going to get my material out on that. Uh, but yeah, mostly that's I've just been promoting the last book, which has been doing very well, actually. Yeah, I actually just watched a, a lecture with you talking about creationism versus, or intelligent design versus science throughout history. Right, yeah. Uh, comparing uh, ancient pagan creationists with modern Ken Ham types. Um, the ancients put Ken Ham to shame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so fascinating to me that, you know, that the ancients, some of them knew that the stars were suns and all sorts of things you don't think about ancient people knowing. Right, yeah. Um, all right, cool. And I also want to mention that Richard is now on Patreon at patreon.com slash Dr. Richard Carrier. So if you enjoy his work like I do, you should support him there. And uh, yes, I think we're going to wrap things up there. So I've been speaking with Richard Carrier and Dan Barker. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Richard Carrier and Dan Barker for joining us on the show. And as I mentioned in the intro, Dan is the co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which works to uphold church-state separation. Learn more over at ffrf.org. You should also check out Dan's podcast, Free Thought Radio. It's one of the first podcasts I ever listened to, and it really played a big role in getting me interested in podcasting, so definitely give it a look. I'd also like to thank everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including Preview 92 in the U.S. and the West London one in the U.K. The West London one writes, Enjoyable and well-produced podcast with great guests, some of whom everyone will already have heard of, but also great introductions to some I haven't. A recent interview with Christopher Buckley introduced me to an author I was unaware of, and I've already ordered The Relic Master, which sounds exactly like the kind of book I will love. Cheers to the Geek's Guide team. So big thanks again to the West London one for that great review. Special thanks as well to Christopher Dreyer, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. 
And I'd like to give a special thank you to longtime listener Juan San Miguel, who just made a very generous contribution to the show via PayPal. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarrkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.